I, I'm just going to do a short meditation and I'm just using from YouTube. Everybody take a moment to settle in and breathe. And you could certainly close your cameras down for this if you want. Now we join with me in a word of prayer. Oh God, our creator, Holy Spirit, wisdom, Jesus, Allah, all of the names of God. We come to you with humility as we begin to try our human hand at understanding your infinite wisdom in all of its forms. Uh, we ask for your blessings over each person here today, those who are celebrating birthdays, those who are, who are mourning loss, those who are starting new things and, and changing journeys. We ask for your peace and your faith and your comfort as we navigate all of these things. Amen. The reason why we are studying the wisdom tradition is as I have been talking to you all and and Ellen has also joined that part of the conversation about the Holy Spirit and how wisdom interacts with resilience and with the fruit of the spirit and all of these different aspects to the spirit and the fact that wisdom, Sophia, is at the root of all that. I wanted to kind of take a step back and look at the broader picture of what is the wisdom tradition. And so basically, the wisdom tradition is not limited to Christianity or Judaism. It's basically encapsulates how different religions and different cultures have come together and written their answers and their suppositions about life's big questions. Like, who are we? Why are we here? What are we supposed to do? Do we have a purpose? Do we not have a purpose? How do we need to live together? And so there's basically different forms of it, and it's a way to deal with practical issues. While the Holy Spirit does inform our spiritual selves, the wisdom tradition also informs our day-to-day -day living. Like if you look at the wisdom literature in the Bible, you'll see that it's in the Old Testament. I'll give you a kind of breakdown of what books this cover. The book of Job, a number of the Psalms, but not all of them. The book of Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, Lamentations, and Jonah. And then you know how we've talked about how there's canonized books, the traditional books of the Bible? Well, in the Catholic, you know, part of what's included in the Bible is the Apocrypha, as Ellen well knows, and a few of you as well, I'm sure. And there's a few extra that are come under in the wisdom tradition in that section as well. And those include the book of Tobit, the wisdom of Ben Sirah, and the wisdom of Solomon and four Maccabees, the fourth book of Maccabees. And then also the book of James and the Proverbs and parables of Jesus are what are considered under the wisdom tradition from the what we call New Testament. Today, I'm gonna to spend time just kind of giving some overviews about what wisdom tradition is, what wisdom literature typically looks like, at least in the Jewish and Christian context, and then if we get past that from an overview perspective only, then I will go into a little tiny bit about what the wisdom tradition looks like in other religions. And at any time, if you have a question, if you need me to repeat something, if you're totally confused, just raise your hand. I've got us on gallery view, so I should be able to see you. And if I don't, he will. The point of the wisdom tradition then, like I said, is to help us learn how to interact, how to have our ethical, moral, philosophical, all the questions, right? They kind of come under wisdom. The genre that, as we know in our form, kind of started in the ancient Near East. Now, the ancient Near East is kind of what we see now as Egypt and Syria and Israel and, you know, kind of like the whole Mesopotamia and the Middle East. So that's kind of what we're saying in the ancient Near East, those kingdoms. And as you remember from various biblical stories, there was like the Assyrian kingdom, there was the Babylonian empire, there were different sort of the Canaanites, you've heard about the Canaanites, 
So the Canaanites actually predated the Israelites and the Canaanites kind of formed with the Israelites to form Israel after the Exodus. So just to kind of give you an idea of what period of time we're talking about. So it was an entire genre. Mesopotamia is where they had many stories. Samaria, Babylon, Assyria, Egypt, like I said. There are other types of literature. Remember how I told you all that the Bible, and a lot of you know this, but the Bible is not one book. It's a library of books. Mm -hmm. So wisdom literature would be, you know, one genre. Two other genres in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament are the law books and the prophets. So, you know, the prophets are pretty self-explanatory, like Jeremiah, Isaiah, Jonah would also be a prophetic book. And then the law is like Deuteronomy, Leviticus, and has more of the, what are you supposed to do in order to serve God and come together as a nation? And then the prophets were about saying, hey, no, that's not it. You got, remember what the law says? You kind of backtrack, come back to this is how we're supposed to live. But the wisdom tradition actually focused on what individual people need to do as well. Whereas the other ones are totally focused on the big picture. The wisdom is focused on the big picture as well, but it's in how we individually behave as a result of following this advice. Now, one of the things that makes the wisdom tradition in the Bible different from other wisdom traditions is that this is the only bunch of wisdom that are focused on God in a monotheistic way, meaning they only believe in one God. There were many other forms of gods and goddesses. And so the one view of God or the God as one, that was the way that this set of wisdom differentiated from all of the others. Now I'm going to pause and let you guys, any thoughts, questions, concerns? Okay. I see heads shaking. That means you're still, you know, alive and, and with me. That's awesome. One thing I, I'd never, I did some research additional from what I kind of picked up over time. And one thing that I learned that I thought was interesting was that they tie the whole concept of the wisdom tradition to a word called sapience. Has anybody else heard that before? Ellen? No, I, I had not heard that. Uh, S-A-P-I-E-N-C-E. -E. That's and related to homo sapiens, as in <clears throat> wise man, as designated by our, uh, our species is homo sapiens, which means wise man. Hmm. Okay. So here it says sapiens is closely related to the term Sophia, often defined as transcendent wisdom, ultimate reality, or the ultimate truth of things. Sapiential perspective of wisdom is said to lie in the heart of every religion where it is often acquired through intuitive knowing. This type of wisdom is described as going beyond mere practical wisdom and includes self-knowledge, interconnectedness, conditioned origination of mind states, and other deep understandings of subjective experience. And I would put on the fact that it would need to be subjective because we each experience the world in a different way. Even in nature, the prey or the prey and the predator, predator. Mm -hmm. and there's the different roles and which plant relies on which other plant. I mean, there's different sorts of interactions. In this type of wisdom, it can also lead to the ability of an individual to act with appropriate judgment, a broad understanding of situations, and greater appreciation and compassion towards other living beings. So now we can sort of see why it would be at the heart 
of all religions and spiritual practices because there's the greater context and our place within that greater context. And of course, because we're each connected in that greater context, what we do individually matters for how we interact with every person around us, thus the interconnectedness. So that's part of when we talk about the Holy Spirit then, when we're listening to the Spirit, you also often hear about the wisdom of nature, and I believe that that's why, because wisdom is present in all of nature, and we're interconnected in all of nature. So sometimes when we listen to that still small voice that we call the Holy Spirit, it is also just everything around us if we're just in tune with it. And so I think that the more we're in tune with wisdom, the more we produce fruit of the spirit. And the more we love our neighbor as ourself, the more we take care of creation. So this wisdom is why we're continuing to go deeper into it because it really seems to be the key of how and why we are to love our neighbor as ourself and how we bring the good news into this realm. That word sapiens also made me think of sapling, like when a sapling comes off of another tree or something like that, and it's from within that tree, it's, it's wisdom that's coming from within that. And in a therapeutic sense, we're always looking for what's coming up from inside of the person's gut and not necessarily what's coming from their head because a lot of time the traumatized brain is saying a lot and the gut is saying something totally different, which is wisdom from the inside also. Mm -hmm. And wisdom from within sounds like what? Gnostics maybe? <laughs> it also sounds like mathematics. <clears throat> um, if you just think about a from a quantum perspective, it sounds like the calculations that are made to produce organisms and things and matter, it, it, how those things are structured based on ratios, it, it also sounds like that kind of wisdom. Like the golden ratio and mm -hmm. the, the conch shells. Yeah. I, I was just going to add that one of the middle definitions you talked about, which combined intuition and experience and broad patterns of ways of being. Mm -hmm. I think that explains why sometimes people are wise as they get older because they experience patterns of behavior repeated yeah. over time such yeah. that they can intuit when they see a couple of the factors, what's likely to happen oh, yeah. next. Uh, and, and that also happens, I think, within context, not just of interactions with being, but I know as a prosecutor, having seen so many fact patterns mm -hmm. that you could give me three of them, I could tell you what's gonna happen, which is also why sometimes listening to the news about the legal stuff, I can tell you people have been, who have, I'm rambling, but people have been watching the news with me. Mm -hmm. I'll sometimes say it before the newscaster says it, just because you know where it's gonna go, right? So mm -hmm. patterns of living, how people behave, that, that, that rang true with me, equating with, you kind of have to have a, not just good intuition, but a little bit of experience behind you. Time, yeah. To, get to the, the, that place, that rang true to me. Absolutely. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom as well. You can learn knowledge, you can read and you can remember it and you have knowledge of something. But until you experience like you said, what that is like. And you said, oh, you know, I, and you can do it even in simpler ways. Like how many of you can predict what's going to happen next on a sitcom or on a typical like soapy type of melodramatic one hour show? You know, you can always predict like, oh, they're building tension, so that means this is going to happen. And now they're relieving the tension, so, oh, the drama. Oh, and now that ratches it up, and it makes like this, you know, very typical sort of roller coaster. Don't watch a movie with me, because I'm, I'm super annoyed. <laughs> like, oh, this is going to happen. They're like, I'm just trying to watch the movie. Well, you better let me go. 
so I did want to talk a little bit about the literature and the kind of structure of the wisdom literature in the Bible. Part of why this matters is because of how we interpret it matters. It's two literary characteristic types, primarily at least, are the short proverbial guidelines, you know, kind of like you see in Proverbs, Spare, spare the rod, spoil the child, oh, even though that's taken out of context quite often. It's a little pithy statement that basically is making a generalized point. But see, this is these are some of the characteristics to keep in mind about the short how to have a happy life statements is that one, they are short. Two, they're easily understood in their cultural context, meaning it's like the common experience of the time in which they were written. They're thought provoking. They're kind of like snap truths that make you go, oh, huh. yeah, I guess that that would be true. I mean, you know, kind of they stick with you in that way. And while they're generally true, they are not always specifically applicable. The way they're written is to, to relay a general truth because in wisdom, we understand that not everything applies to everybody in exactly the same way and in exactly the same time. It's like that expression, a general rule of thumb. These proverbs would be in the vein of a general rule of thumb. So that's the first or literary character type. The second form is longer developed specific topic. And those are in the form of monologues, dialogues, essays. And in those forms, they deal with major life questions and mysteries. And the sages who wrote these were always willing to challenge the status quo. So can you picture which book of the Bible might fit the longer genre? I know Ellen can answer it. I'll give you a recap of what the books are in the Old Testament that, that follow wisdom. And so remember, longer developed special topic, monologues, dialogues, essays, major questions, and the books of the Bible in the Old Testament that fit this are Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, Lamentations, and Jonah. So which of those might fit the longer story? Job and Ecclesiastes. Job, absolutely. Ecclesiastes, I think, still fits more in the saying category because it's for every season and like different things and it kind of lays out a bunch of specific situations but yes thank you job because job is answering the question does god cause suffering or alternatively why does god allow suffering if god is loving so those are very important questions that we wrestle with every single day of our lives but so instead of having like short little advice statements, the book of Job through monologue and dialogue and essay a little essay. bit. I think yeah, monologue yeah, I and dialogue primarily. Poetry. Here's some poetry, poetry and poetry. Yeah, like prose form. Yes. For sure. And it definitely challenges the status quo because Job is questioning God and his friends are saying, don't do that. If you question God, for sure, you're going to get struck down. And that was the status quo, that God was a God of vengeance. And, you know, it was, if you did something wrong, you got punished. If you did something right, you got blessings. Like that was the culture of the time. So it questioned that. And in such a way that you really have to kind of read the whole book to get the whole sort of thing behind it. It's not something that can just be like, oh, it's all, it all works out in the end and blah, 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 happy, mm -hmm. peace and love, bye-bye. <laughs> you know, it really wrestles with God. Like and it's, and so that's like why, I mean, Job, as you could probably tell, is my favorite 
<laughs> among the wisdom tradition. But that's why, because it goes deep into simple yet complicated questions that matter to us. An interesting thing that in addition to challenging the status quo, the personification of wisdom is always female. And for a, a religion, a couple of religions that seem to be pretty anti the feminine side of things, I think it's interesting that wisdom, which is what is supposed to permeate everything we do, how we interact with God, how we interact with each other, how we understand ourselves, all stems from the feminine. So I'm going to pause and take a drink of water and let that just sit on you for a minute. I think that's an appropriate conversation for Mother's Day, especially because here it is again, a being that can take a seed. It's kind of like the earth that can take a seed into it <clears throat> and house and nurture that seed to its eventuality without uh, any male intervention that, you know, once the earth produces that plant, it has its life cycle and the wisdom that's programmed into it, which it cannot violate. Unlike humans, we violate our nature all the time. And so we have a bunch of different problems that the animals don't have. You know, they might have a fur ball or, you know, something specific that they always have, but they never have different stuff unless they come in contact with something that we're doing. That's a really good addition to the point, because I think, yeah. you know, the way that climate changes and human interactions with climate and the way that like some habitats are destroyed, I think those types of things do actually cause changes in what is natural in actual plants and animals as well and how they have to adapt. And we were talking today about how interesting it is that toxic patriarchy seems to wanna remove the feminine voice from leadership, but cannot get to the planet without the woman to remove her from speaking. I have a question sort of. Uh... Okay. And never know whether there's a question or, or just want you to go further. Sure. Okay. Uh, it's two parts. Is Job the only wisdom in the, as you were talking, I was thinking, and I understood the Ecclesiastes, but what about those stories in numbers? I think, do the, or do those go more with the parables in the New Testament? I think that yeah. numbers goes more with um, the law because like they talk about inheritance in numbers about like, can, can these daughters, Zebediah's daughters, I think that's it. Somebody that starts with a Z has three daughters and he dies. And so there's a whole question in numbers that's about D, I think. maybe okay. whether they can inherit or not. So I, I think numbers still counts under law. Wisdom literature really means not that you can't develop wisdom from the entirety of the Bible, but that it's written specifically kind for of that purpose. This tradition mm -hmm. uh, is what they're they're saying. I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was just yeah. going to say since you decided to mention patriarchy, and I wasn't going to go there, but <laughs> um, no, I, I it's all a little bit to the side. But I was at a Books a Million today to sort of get out of the house and have a way to celebrate and to buy a book but you know, all the voices screaming at you in a bookstore except for possibly fiction which is its own creative thing mm -hmm. all men right there are more even african-american men and white men on the bookshelves than there are women right mm -hmm. and yet it is the women that uh, you said much more beautifully than I can, Thaddeus, that are the creative forces behind all of this and they, these voices get clammed down. So it's, it's evident in a lot of ways. So thank you for letting me tell you my annoyance from this afternoon. Absolutely. But I bought a book by an African-American woman. I bought a mystery by, I don't know what she is, but a woman. So 
And we Thank you for sharing that. I mean, that we bring a real life to the Bible studies and the other studies. Yeah. So yes. This is real experience. And, and this is something that you've experienced over time, which is part of the qualification for wisdom. So yeah. When we talk about the fact that Hebrew wisdom is very practical and it's based on experience and not special revelation, even having it worded that way kind of implies that the people who go through it are the ones who have it. You know, whereas a lot of times we say, oh, only, you know, this preacher or that person or that they're the only ones who hear from God. And so God is mysterious unless you're specially chosen for revelation. Sure, you can be chosen for revelation. However, that does not negate the power of the wisdom that each and every one of us experiences by the fact that we continue to breathe, we continue to live, grow love, lose people and things. And all of those experiences give us wisdom. So I like the kind of egalitarian nature of wisdom as well. No one is ever excluded from wisdom. We might judge that they have no wisdom, but <laughs> that's more, you know, our opinion. Right. <laughs> because everybody has experience, right? We may not understand what another person's experience is, but we all have experiences as we continue to live. And every creation is a wise one. If God looked at the creation and said, it is good. You're talking about people specifically that contain so many trillion cells and they all function together. And, and I tell folks like you'll put premium gas in your car and you know, shine it all up and everything, but then your body can heal itself if it's damaged. And, you know, you think the Ferrari is magnificent, but then you'll go eat, you know, some junk food. This is, this, the creation of God is the best. I mean, our bodies are our temples. Um, and I just a note, since we have a couple of kiddos, that one of the big things that stood out to me that uh, one of the big big things that stood out to me as a part of wisdom is the uh, intuitive knowing which mm -hmm. I think kids have a lot of uh, yeah. whereas the world tends to get in the way of a lot of the adults uh, intuitive knowing so kids oftentimes have a lot of wisdom yes yes I have zero qualms about anything you just <laughs> like from the mouths preach. of babes <laughs> he's not a babe anymore <laughs> Well, no, but she, no, he's agreeing with what but she yeah. said. Yeah, that, right, right. What she said is actually... They, you know, that's why we have that TV show, Kids Say the Darndest Things, because that's that's the wiring that's put there by the creator that's coming from these little people. And it's like, you've been here before. No, the creator that made you has been here before. Well, I think one of the things about talking about intuition and just to piggyback, because I think it is wisdom, I think Definitely. we are born with, and we see it in our children, their wisdom, because they come with a connection of holiness or whatever you want to call it. And as a parent, uh, even though I had to backtrack some, when I found that out mm -hmm. after I was already a parent, I thought, oh my, that changes my teaching, that changes the way. I handle things at home most of the time, try to. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I had a second chance. But I mean, it's it's something well worth knowing that intuition. And every time I deny my intuition, I get in trouble. Definitely. And I, and I think that's the other side for parents to remember. So somewhere along the line, I got encouraged to keep asking and exploring. And I think as parents and up to great grandparents, we need to continue to encourage that in our children to keep that thread. Yeah. And I didn't mean to sermonize, I just, you brought it out or it got oh. out. Meredith brought it out, actually. Yeah. Well, we were. But, yes. Out, sorry. It, no, you, you don't need to say you're sorry. You're allowed yeah. to talk. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I love that you brought that up, Meredith, because I think that when you think about the context of how, how much adverse childhood damage we have 
you know, how, how kids deal with hard things from young ages. I think if we listen to kids more, we could kind of avert some of that. And with the knowledge that if you think about how God wants us to be the fruit of the spirit, mm -hmm. can you think of another human that embodies the fruit of the spirit more than children before they are damaged by adults? That's why the scripture is saying suffer the little children unto me because the innocence there mm -hmm. is, is the same innocence that was crucified. So I'm just, I'm just sitting on that point because that was awesome. All right. And until you, and there's all those sayings of Jesus, uh, which are until you become like little children, you, and it's in the Gnostic gospels too. And until you mm -hmm. become like children, you cannot be like me which is to give away those worldly things we learned. And take your innocence back. And all goes to that definitional thing of the intuition. It's not covered up by all these stuff we learn from adults, but yeah, it's, it's throughout the gospels. And that's why we should teach as well, so that the children could even understand it. So this theme of wisdom, mother and child containing wisdom or sapling containing wisdom is it's like it is a sustainable sort of loop. Mm -hmm. I think a good question to ask is why do we do, why do we want to take away the innocence of children? Why do we want to take away the wonder and the awe and the curiosity? And why can't we ask questions? I mean, I promise you all, I asked all the questions when I was a child and I never stopped. It drove my parents absolutely bananas. But we should never stop people from asking questions because the damage that that does to kids, when you tell them, no, you can't ask those questions or you just kind of brush it off. When we're kids, that's when we learn the most about how to be human. And we have to think about when we're teaching our kids do we want them to be fully who God created them to be? Or are we trying to mold them into a smaller form that we think fits in a world that might otherwise hurt them? You look at it from a cybernetic frame. If you, if you have a computer and you need, to up, you need to put an operating system on it and you need to put different softwares on it so that it can function the way you need it to function, to tell that child no as it's loading up all of the software that goes with the hardware, it does kind of break the, the expansion of the person. So it will break the functionality of the person when that's stifled as much as it can be a problem or, you know, uh, it can feel problematic as questions continue to come and come and come and come like that rapid fire. Go ahead, Leslie. You know, another thing that I've, I've been, I've been arguing with God for the last week and a half or so, a lot. Um, I, imagine. I have been, you know, we've been having some heart to heart discussions to put it mildly. And, you know, I have noticed that there are various people who find that scary mm. and think I'm, you know, basically, you know, you were talking about Joe, you know, Job argued with God, and it's like they think I'm going to get clobbered basically by arguing with God. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any alternative. Right. Not in a relationship. Mm -mm. That's right. That I think I have to engage God in this point. And you know, I one of the things I, I this morning I got up and I read the story of jacob wrestling they said you know the common word is wrestling with an angel but he was wrestling with god is basically right. if you read the scripture he was wrestling with god definitely and he said you know i will not let you go until you bless me and i've been saying to god i will not let you go whether or not you bless me hmm. i simply will not let you go well good regardless 
I think yeah. that's what Job came to. I think that's what Job came to as well, that God had a bigger picture. But but the healing, you know, the fact that you're wrestling with God, you should keep wrestling with God because Job wrestled with God until Job got an answer that calmed Job's spirit. It might not be the same answer you get because that might not be what calms your spirit. But if you yeah. think about in grief, and you are experiencing grief. Oh yeah. We need people to just be that healthy presence for us who doesn't judge, who doesn't say, oh no, you shouldn't feel that way. Or, oh, you'll, it'll be all fine in five days when no one knows such a thing. As <laughs> God well, said, is that container. Well, I said to my, I mentioned to my cousin who we were visiting with my mother the other day, I said, well, I, she asked me how I, that was. And I said, well, I'm arguing with God a lot. She said, well, well, you can't win. And I thought, well, <laughs> Jacob did. And you know, it's funny because the legalistic <laughs> mind, the, the religious mind mm -hmm. would say, just be a robot, mm -hmm. right? But the, the spirit is saying, this is a relationship. This is an intimate relationship that is closer to you than your jugular vein. So how could you not communicate back and forth your joy as well as your pain. That would be a cheap God if we couldn't get in there and say, hey God, this is what's real for me. Like and I'm mad. What how do you what do you have to say about it? And you know, a few weeks ago mm -hmm. I started praying to think the thoughts of God. Mm -hmm. And I Laura Archer and I had this conversation about, you know, maybe we we read in Isaiah it's used in the context of Jesus, a man of sorrows and, and acquainted with grief. You know, maybe God is more upset about death and how things are than we are. I, I have no argument with that either. Okay, well, I also see that Jill is unmuted. Did you want to answer any? Well, it's just the, the curiosity that before corruption came in, things were sustainable and based on the wisdom of sustainability. So just thinking about that, but yeah. Well, I do know that, you know, you were questioning the, the innocence and not, not questioning. And we are in such a structured society, right? That as we get older, we're, we're bound and controlled by institutions. So whether that be church whether that be school so that's i feel where all the boundaries start getting built as we get older is as we start engaging in various institutions that want to limit that curiosity and i don't know that it's always intentional as it is for their purposes a sense of control and practicality so in other words if you're in a you know school environment if you've got 20 kids asking 20 questions every minute it's impossible right i mean truly you, you, at some point you have to keep the class moving and that and it's unfortunate but that's the way that it's been structured and then it, of course we all know the church in its structure as to control the congregants you know so just kind of thinking through that yeah it's it's the beauty of children's honesty and innocence and unfiltered <laughs> joy <laughs> voice yeah um that is very appealing but is uh, always stifled as you get older. And I heard you say for practical purposes. And I think that's part of the conversation for sure, because, you know, there are practical things like you don't want your child to touch a hot stove. You don't want your mm -hmm. child to put their finger in a light socket. You know, there's mm -hmm. practice. You don't want them to play with knives or run with scissors or any of the, the things, right? Yeah. But Correct. that's also how they learn. So it's, it's, it's a very catch-22 situation mm -hmm. because, 
you know, if you slap their hand from not touching the stove, like they might learn, but if they actually get to touch the stove, you better believe they learn that. <laughs> so there's, right. but, it's, and a, I, it's a balance of safety and freedom, you know, and I think that that's the same the same question we have as adults like how much safety or what we call security versus freedom how much freedom is too much freedom how much safety is actually safe you know i think that brings up that whole question mm -hmm. and children will answer those questions for themselves until they can get old enough to be whatever but the balance is what is so important in this because you have to be able to say Meredith's father started to run out into the street because he saw somebody new on the other side of a residential street in downtown Indianapolis. And as I said no, or stop, whatever word I said, the car stopped less than an inch from that child who was two. I would tell you God helped a big bit in that. It, it, it is a balance when you're in charge of a congregation or an office or a family. So just to tell on, on myself, because you know it's Mother's Day, I feel like I should give my mother some props because she did have to keep me alive and that was difficult. So when I was two, we lived in England and my mother was pregnant with my younger brother. Well, you're not gonna believe this, but I was super curious and I like to explore things. And I was always trying to say, oh, what's over there? I think I'll go over there and find out. Well, my mom was doing laundry and we had a back door and there was a skeleton key that was hanging on the wall. So at age two, my mom tells me that I took a stool over there, stood on it, got the key, unlocked the door, in only my diaper, mind you, no oh, shirt, of no shoes, no nothing, just my diaper. And I went out of the house and went to the center of town. <laughs> and my mom, when she realized that I was not in the house anymore, my dad was out of town, she was pregnant with my brother. I'm actually shocked she did not give birth from the horror of knowing that her two-year-old daughter was out in the street. Mm -hmm. So somehow, kind of like how, you know, the car stopped, there was someone in town that like took my hand and was walking up and down the streets trying to find my mom. So <laughs> ultimately, my mom could find me. So yes, balance is key. Did you have any other things you wanted to add to that, Jill, about your questioning? No. Well, the, the <laughs> traditional mind that was held by Joe's friends is not the same mindset that was wrestling right so we have to decide are we going to take tradition and become a robot for god and give god back the thing that's given or are we going to be a natural growing expanding spiritual being that is different and interacting with god different as it grows we are right at an hour. So one of the things I'm going to ask you all to do as we think about wisdom in the, in the mindset of a child, because thanks, Meredith. See, wisdom just worked through Meredith today, y'all, because we went on this, on this new journey through the kids' wisdom, and I just love it. And so what I want you all to do this week is focus on awe, A-W-E, and wonder because the way that kids are so curious about everything they don't act like they know already they're just like oh what is that what is that what is that why is that what about this i want you all to practice doing that noticing beautiful flowers noticing sunsets noticing even the tiny things that make you curious or inspire joy or any other fruit of the spirit but specifically focus on looking for awe and wonder and see how the spiritual fruit goes through you this week. So that's my homework. Well, do you want to close us in prayer? All right, so pray with me. Dear God, we come to you today just asking for peace and asking for your covering 
for all the people who we're concerned with in our hearts, in our conscious mind and in our subconscious mind, all the issues we're concerned with in our conscious mind and our subconscious mind, God, settle that, bring peace to that. And if it's not time for that peace just yet, allow us the space to come to you with the feelings of that experience. Hope and the comfort and peace and joy is on its way towards us and not away from us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.